I started drinking at a very early age, as soon as I could get my hands on it. You know, as a young kid, you know, uh, the hospital told me I could never drink again, that I had sclerosis, and I, I'd had my last right thread a couple of times. You know, for me, the heartbreaking thing was that when I wanted to stop and I couldn't, what my brain was remembering was, was all the times that it had made me feel good. At, at the heart of a lot of addiction and relapse is uh, memories linking cues in the environment to uh, the uncontrollable urge to use drugs. That's a, that, it, that is at the crux of it, you know, the, there is a spark inside of your head that when you're not feeling totally happy that tells you that, that a drink and or a drug will change that. If we can get these associative memories around alcohol to destabilise, uh, you can fundamentally alter the way uh, it persists or you can stop it persisting potentially uh, in its entirety. Memory tells us how to behave in certain situations. It tells us how we can find rewards and how we can avoid getting punishments. Um, drugs tap into that system particularly strongly by being highly rewarding. So we're very ready to learn about things that predict drugs and how we can get them. Uh, in certain circumstances that can lead to these memories kind of overtaking behaviour and driving towards continued drug use with an extremely motivated behavioural response. And that's what we see in addiction. I can't remember the first time I got drunk. Um, I just remember that whenever there was alcohol about, I would always drink it because I loved the way it made me feel. And I'd sometimes, as a little lad, drink things that would make me sick, and that didn't seem to matter. I would do anything that made me feel feel different. And in the end, you know, um, um, my organs just decided to, to stop working and I collapsed. People tend to start using alcohol, obviously it's a legal drug um, in a social setting. People might use it for other different reasons including, you know, if they've got other emotional or social problems uh, as a kind of self-medication. And all of these things determine like how rewarding people find alcohol. So uh, if it's used socially then it's going to be a big social reward, you're happy when you're using it. If you're using it to reduce the kind of negative emotions that you experience due to something else, maybe depression, uh, then it's also going to have a kind of rewarding value by alleviating those feelings. And um, so you're learning this really high reward value of alcohol. And then despite people's best efforts, because they're always surrounded by these reminders of drinking, there's no way for them to really break out of that cycle. Those feelings are being triggered by these memory associations that are learned during drug use. So if we can weaken those, then we give people a fighting chance after they've managed uh, to become abstinent, to stay abstinent in the long term, so that those kind of pernicious memories don't keep resurfacing and causing relapse. So a good way to think about memories in terms of how they're formed and updated and changed is like a bunch of Lego bricks. So if you had a load of Lego bricks, which are kind of, the, kind of like the neurons in your brain, by sticking them together in certain configurations, you can, you can build anything, you can build any shape you want, you can create any memory that the, the world might uh, throw at you. If you've built something and you realise that it's not quite right, say a brick's out of place somewhere, you need to break down that structure and rebuild it to make it in the new form that's correct. And the brain's doing that all the time because the world's changing around us. It's, it's updating our memories to keep them relevant, to keep, make sure they're predicting the right things. Uh, so if you get in there between that point where they're unstable and between when they restabilize their updated form and interfere with a drug or with some new learning, you can either stop them being rebuilt and so they're, they'll just be kind of a pile of Lego bricks, a weakened memory, or you can reconfigure them in a new way so it would be a completely different structure altogether. My interest is in addiction and new treatments for addiction. But there's very few studies that exist currently looking at doing this kind of treatment in humans. But that learning process, this idea of, of maladaptive learning, can be extended to lots of other psychiatric disorders. Research on anxiety disorders, both in humans and in animals, can be used and translated to develop interventions for people with addiction. To sum up my phobia in one sentence, um, being so afraid of a spider that if you see a spider, you can't focus on anything else. Addiction. 
suppose it's the need to have something more than anything else. Even if you try to think about it in a different way, you can't. I couldn't override it. You know, I didn't have, I didn't have enough power to do that. Even if you know that it is silly what you're doing. And I'd be saying to myself, right, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna drink or use again. You can't stop thinking about it in that way because that's just how you see it and how you feel about it, and you really believe that spider is going to jump at you. I've been afraid of spiders, well, as long as I can remember, all my life. So I saw this, uh, this research, and then I read, if you're afraid of spiders, you can participate. She was like the fourth or fifth participant, was uh, Sasha. Um, from the treatment, I expected um, not really much, because I didn't know a lot about it, and I hoped it would work, but I wasn't sure it would. She was so terrified, so she started to cry. And I would just stare at that spot, like, oh shit. What we do in memory reconsolidation intervention is we target the fear memory itself and try to weaken or even erase the memory. My name is Elisa and I'm here to try and fix my spider uh, phobia, I guess you can call it. <laughs> Let me enter this room. Uh -huh. Okay. So then I'm going to ask you some questions about your spider, your spider phobia. Yeah. Uh, the day of my treatment, I got there and I had to fill in a lot of questions uh, about my phobia first. And then they asked me to go to the other room where the spider was. He was in a cage uh, and the door was open. I immediately saw that the door was open. And they asked me to get close to uh, a line on the ground or to at least get close to the line. And if I could go further uh, near the cage and I couldn't even get close to the line. What could happen? Yeah, I know nothing will probably happen, but I'm just uh, scared. Yeah. Um. First I asked them to touch the tamantula. I asked them how much they fear they experience, how much a distress they experience um, up to a maximum of uh, fear memory reactivation when they are really in a uh, mode of approaching the tarantula they in fact do not touch the tarantula I stop I close the tank and we walk to the other room upon memory retrieval or memory reactivation this in fact offers an, a window of opportunity to interfere with the memory itself and we give our participants a drug propanolol which interferes with the uh, protein synthesis necessary to restabilize the memory trace i took the pill and then i could go that was the first day and then we normally ask them to come back one week later in our previous study also uh, three months later and one year later and we do behavior tests with spiders to see whether the um, fear behavior has been changed. I've been dreaming of spiders last night. <laughs> so you can walk to the yellow line again. Yeah. I open the tank. There he is again. When I got in there, um, I, they asked me to get close to the cage and I was like, yeah, I can do that. And I was just like, wait a minute, yeah, I can do that, huh, okay. And I got close to the cage and I was looking at that spider and not afraid at all. And I just knew in my head, like, but I'm really, really afraid of this spider and I'm, I'm terrified of this spider. I'm, af I'm afraid that he can jump out of the cage. and. And I didn't feel that. I didn't feel any fear at all. And they asked, can you touch it? And I was like, yeah. She, she touched it. She asked me, can I put the spider on my hand? And it, I could not believe it. Although I, I was aware, of course, of all the animal literature, of our own studies on fear conditioning. I see many, many times the effect in the lab, but I still could not Belief that it was possible to change uh, such a strong fear behavior in, in, in fact, a very uh, brief intervention. How do you feel in terms of distress or fear on a scale from zero to 100? Um, I'm a little bit nervous. But yes. And how now much? I'm actually touching. Mwah. I was kind of um, preparing myself to do it. I wanted to do it. 
But I'm not sure if I really expected it because yesterday I was more scared than I thought I would be. Yesterday I thought I would be able to just grab it and I would be fine, but I was not that uh, <laughs> brave yesterday. But today I feel okay. Can we get it out? Huh. I actually feel completely relaxed and kind of intrigued. When I look back on it, I'm really happy how it went because it, it's really a change in my life and the expectation was lower than what it, yeah, how it turned out to be. One of the main things with addiction is the strength of the memories that we're dealing with. They're going to be just maybe orders of magnitude stronger than the, the learning that's gone on in, in a phobia. And that's, that's why we're doing a lot of the research that we're doing. Uh, it's not actually that easy to destabilise a memory that's as well learned as, as the ones that, uh, that exist in, in alcoholism or any other drug addiction because they're learned over thousands or tens of thousands of episodes. But the similarity between addiction and anxiety disorders means that uh, uh, we can learn from animal work uh, on addiction uh, and also the other way around. It's still kind of early days for this treatment. We're doing some of the first studies looking at it in humans. Um, I think it shows really great promise out of everything that we've had so far in the, that's come out of kind of the basic neuroscience and pharmacology of addiction. This is the first way that we really found that we could potentially permanently modify these problematic memories. I don't know until it, until it came out where there was a treatment that would instantly solve that craving, but I'm sure it would be a massive help to most every people who, who, who want to stop drinking or using. With phobias and addiction, it's got a big influence on your life. It, it's something you you experience daily because with spiders you see spiders daily. They are everywhere and also with addiction I can imagine that it's in your head every day and you're busy with it every day so if something changes something that's in every day you live then of course your life is really different.